Hello and welcome to the Economic Circle. I'm Dr. Alexander Mosley, the founder. We're here to help improve your grades and improve your wealth prospects. Now, in this module, we're going to be looking at the economics of migration, a very basic analysis. There are many facets to it. Migration, simply put, is the movement of people from one area to another. Now, this can be within a particular political jurisdiction or across separate jurisdictions. When people move around a jurisdiction where there is only one state authority, then the effect is economic and cultural in character. The movement will affect prices and wages, say, and have sociological effects that can be observed and described, such as effects on language, music, health, commercial practices, etiquette, gender, racial, religious issues, intermarriage, and so on. Now, we're going to be looking at the effects on prices in a moment, and wages in particular. But where national authorities are also affected, then the character of the movement is also political. In other words, it relates to power and issues of power, as well as economic and cultural, as states will have to deal with rules on entry and exit, tax payments and access to state-funded or provided services such as healthcare, education or unemployment assistance. Now, what often attracts the media attention, especially recently, 2014-15, is the plight of international refugees and migrants rather than internal migration within a country. Partly this is because we have barriers to movement around countries that hinder or filter international movement. Economically, government erected barriers in turn create queues and bottlenecks, which inevitably create human frustration, tragedy and hence attract media attention. Now let's have a look at the economics of this. So imagine a country in which the wages for a particular kind of work, let's say, are equal. There are QN workers who have employment in the north and QS1 workers have employment in the south. Now this is what we call an imaginary construction. It assumes that all conditions are equal and it's a stationary state in which nothing is changing or causing alterations to perceived conditions or wages. It's a useful starting point for us economists, but now let's imagine that the south undergoes a real boom. Let's say the South experiences an increase in demand for its produce from another country. Now this encourages entrepreneurs to take up more factors of production including workers, so the demand for labour in the South shifts to DL2. Given no migration has yet taken place, wages are being pushed up to W2 as firms try to secure more work, more workers into their jobs. But this is now going to have two effects. First of all, it's going to send a price signal, a wage signal in this case, up to people working in the north. And it's also going to attract those people in the north down to the south, in other words, migration. The two effects. One, the supply curve in the south is going to shift to the right as people enter the southern job market. Now, supply curve will therefore shift from SL to SL2. This causes the wage rate, which has reached a high of W2, to come down to W3. Secondly, the migration from the north causes the supply curve of labour there to shift to the left because people have left the northern job markets, and this will shift it to the left to SL2. This reduction in labour causes wages to rise as the businesses in the north try to stem the flow of labour to the south. Now note that employment in the north has dropped to QN2, but it's increased in the south to QS2. That's an obvious result of the migration from north to south. This reflects the shift in the macro employment conditions between one part of the country and another. Now logically, on the microeconomic side of it, with everything else being held constant, wages will return to a new equilibrium of W3, reflecting the real growth in production and demand in the south. In other words, the north will also enjoy an increase in wages from W1 to W3, albeit with fewer workers than before. Now, grasping the logic of this is really important. It helps us to understand the nature of internal migration and why wages will eventually settle onto a new high if one area is enjoying real growth, or a new low if one area is suffering from a declining growth. In our model, we're assuming the existence of two markets, a northern market and a southern market, and we're assuming all the usual conditions that affect demand and supply are held constant. But the reality of the economy is that there will be many other factors affecting the movement and timing of the convergence onto the new equilibrium. 
People are in contracts, sticky wages. People are attached to where they live, and higher wages in the South may not appeal automatically to Northern folk who prefer to forgo higher wages for being close to family or being in an environment they prefer. We're also ignoring the actual moving costs and the potentially rising cost of living in the South relative to the North as house prices and rents are bid up in the South and bid down in the North. These and many other personal and sociological reasons dilute the precision of the logical analysis. In other words, people get in the way of the maths. While the migration to the South will create economic forces to converge on a new national wage equilibrium, W3 in our example, for a particular kind of job, let's say, the particular factors involved can impede the movement towards a new equilibrium. So again, let's review those factors because this is what gets you higher marks in a basic analysis in economics. We're looking at a single change in economic conditions, but rarely does that happen. Economic changes are also occurring all the time and with a subtlety that can barely be seen. There may, for example, be an upturn in some of the northern industries or a downturn in some of those in the south. There may be an increased preference for living in the north or a change in technology that enables people to remain in the north but satisfy customers with or through the firms in the south. They can all add up to alter the economic flows, but that is how the market works. Now we're going to throw a spanner in the works. Let's make the North and South different countries, upland and downland. Should have flatland really, shouldn't we? Now downland is going through a real boom which naturally attracts people from upland. The same analysis would work between countries as, be as within a country so long as there is free movement of people. But this time we're going to put in restraints on the people of upland moving into downland. The upland government limits the numbers of people who can move into upland legally, i.e. using the force of the state, the jurisdiction of the police, the army, the border controls, etc., to impose legal restrictions, i.e. enforced restrictions on the movement of people. So let's go over the equilibrium again. Downland enjoys an increase in demand for its products, which cause the demand curve for labour to shift to the right to DL2. This increases the wage rate to W2. In the absence of migration, downland wages will remain at W2 and employment will increase to QD2. But this higher wage rate acts as a signal to the people of upland to migrate to downland. And from the previous analysis, we know that this would eventually equalise wages across, uh, let's say, to an, an international wage rate equilibrium. But now we're going to impose a quota on immigration. The higher wage rate is attracting workers from upland. So the supply curve in downland shifts to the right to SL2 and to the left in upland. But the convergence onto the equilibrium wage is going to be hindered by the quota, which is, say, set at Q star in downland. This quota at Q star acts to stop more migrants entering the downland economy. Graphically, the supply curve becomes vertical at Q star, reflecting the absolute number of migrants permitted. Note that the new wage will be higher than the potential equilibrium which would have occurred if we allow natural free migration at W3. The new equilibrium is going to be at W4, the yellow line, which is higher than W3. So the wages in downland end up being higher than wages in upland, which creates an economic distortion. The workers from upland want to move to downland, given the higher signal, but they hit queues. And insofar as they try to get in, they will spend precious time, energy and money to secure entrance or lose income and opportunities while waiting to see if they are part of the quota. The extent to which W4 is higher than W3 will determine the size of the distortion and obviously the higher it is the more people will be queuing and risking lost earnings and more to secure work in the higher paying country. But of course it's not just about sending in visa applications and waiting. It can also mean people risking fines or even their lives to get around the quotas. So-called illegal immigrants, i.e. those people who are attracted to the possibility of higher paying wages but who do not proceed through formal channels created by the state to legally hinder their migration, tend to work in the grey and black markets, 
And because of this, they tend to be more vulnerable to criminal activity and have little recourse to the proper law. This increases the costs associated with migrating relative to the benefits, but still, for many people around the world, the possibility of making a better life over the border is worth it. Now, geographers know to push and pull factors that are useful to consider here, because often people come across this when they're doing basic high school geography. The push factors are basically what we call costs. To an economist, these are just costs. If the costs of staying put increase, then the push incentive to leave increases. In other words, the pain of staying is increasing. Push factors can inc include increased threats to life and death, such as disease and war, or political ineptitude and corruption, or just basic poverty. Pull factors are basically the potential or incentive for higher rewards in the other country. And they're not always necessarily higher wage. It could be access to a better standard of living or health or entrepreneurial opportunities or simply peace and an accountable government. As with any economic decision, the monetary costs and benefits are always there, but they do not always tell the full story. Monetary costs and benefits are always subjective and interpreted by people differently depending on their values and the context they live in. One person, in other words, may react quicker to a change in wages in downland than another who has other reasons to stay. And these reasons are not always reflective of what is currently happening in life and the markets. People are also governed greatly by their expectations of what will happen in the future. Some people will hope to see an economic recession or inflation through and will not take action. Others will hope that a war will blow over quickly. In other words, some people will take action, some won't. And it's got nothing to do with being rational or irrational. It has a lot to do with the subjectively perceived benefits or expectations of moving versus not moving. Now, returning to the quota no notion, states impose migration restrictions just as parishes and cities used to in the past in many European countries because of the economic threat to local wages. Immigration causes wages to fall or not to rise as much as they could otherwise do. So controls on immigration protects local people from international competition in the same way that import quotas and tariffs do on local produce and services. They also have the same effect as minimum wages or union wages, which act to attract people into an industry, because the wages are higher, but effectively bar them from openly competing through offering themselves for a lower wage than the locals. Arguably, behind all the reasons presented for keeping people out of a country, most of them fear-based, in other words, false evidence appearing real, the underlying economic logic is that newcomers would put a downward pressure on wages. Now, no one worries about such pressures when it comes to people in the north moving south within a country, but the artificial boundary enforced between political jurisdictions suddenly makes it important. And as with all interventions, though, there are intended and unintended costs. People risk their lives. Firms cannot freely offer their work to cheaper labour. And the converse of that is that poorer people from other countries cannot gain access to the richer markets and therefore are likely to remain poorer. The state, in effect, creates a wedge between peoples who would otherwise interact and exchange frequently. And the results, as we've seen on the news in the past 18 months and longer, can often be tragic. Thank you for listening. Any comments, more than welcome. Please keep it academic, rather than going off on race, religious issues or conspiracy theories. This is an economic module, and we want to look at the logic. And if you've got any input on that, please feel free to share it. Thanks for listening. Bye now.